Alright, I may have exaggerated a little bit with that title. It's just that I've been hearing people praise this game to hell, huh? And back, saying it's a hidden gem, an underrated masterpiece, even that it's the best of the classic Doom titles. It's just a very black and white way of looking at media that I see too often online. It's always either the best game ever made, or it's an awful pile of trash with no redeeming qualities. There's no middle ground with nuance, just either or. While I, on the other hand, would argue that the game isn't underrated whatsoever. In fact, it had been very fairly rated at the time, with scores around 7 to 8 out of 10, often citing the same issues that I'm going to talk about in this video. And these scores are similar to what I received these days. The most dated complaints from 1997 are the comparisons to other games at the time like Turok, as well as how little the movement was improved, especially in the lack of jumping or even just looking up and down. Problems that still exist these days, but which matter little. Just because Pac-Man is simplistic and pixelated doesn't mean it's not a gay old time anymore. The harshest review I could find was one by Jeff Gerstmann, or Gerstmann? Who gave it a 4.8 out of 10. But idiotic score systems aside, while he does call it a bastardization of the original, he does make the point that even back then, custom Doom Wars had offered just as much, if not more. Now, I don't really hate the game, it's definitely not worse than Doom 1 and 2, heck, it's not even a bad game whatsoever. I wouldn't say it was underrated, as much as I'd say it was overlooked, at the time at least. Basically, I think I'd upgrade the title of the video to Doom 64, a diamond in the rough. Not perfect, but not without any upsides. Not terrible, but also not without some glaring setbacks. So, let's address those flaws to see if Doom 64 really is as amazing as everybody claims, and begin by talking about... the good. First of all, the most obvious features, the graphics and audio. Doom 64 simply looks astonishing, with its pre-rendered 3D models for its reinterpretations of classic Doom characters. I'd probably say that this version of Doom Guy is my favorite. Not that the other characters are lacking, no. Pinkies look genuinely menacing here, and I love how they gave the Pale Elemental his own personality, instead of being an amalgamation of every other demon. There's a very big theme of cohesion in Doom 64, where no texture or object looks out of place. It has a very distinct, very gothic, and very moody art style, making excellent use of colored lights to give a sense of unease yet awe. Doom 1 and 2 levels were often noisy and chaotic, like a Hornimus Bush painting. While Doom 64 looks essentially like a precursor to Quake 1, with very specific architecture that may get repetitive after a while, but never feels disorganized. These stages are the best looking out of any Doom game, no question about it. A lot of them have incredible pieces of decoration, getting very creative with the limitations of the engine, and then pushing them further. There's even 3D floors now, with rooms over rooms, and yet it doesn't feel out of place or confusing. It's very interested in testing out new gimmicks, like advanced crushers, and even cameras, never dwelling on any before they become stale. And I'll admit, one of them genuinely made me jump. They never had anything like this before, this is incredible! And the audio keeps this foreboding experimental aura. Do one was full of metal. <laughs> Doom 2 had launch music. But Doom 64 has neither. Instead, it's collections of disturbing industrial and otherworldly noises pieced together to form a whole. Much like the visuals, it blurs together, but never feels like it overstays its welcome. The one negative criticism I can give in that regard is that it goes against the game's themes. Doom 64 takes place after the previous two, so it makes little sense for Doom Guy to be feeling a sense of unease. In fact, the text blurbs seem to hammer down the point just how eager he is to tear the demons a new one. This sort of music would have fit the first game better, where you were truly alone and didn't know if you were going to make it. But that's not a big issue whatsoever. While 64 shares a lot of these elements with Doom on the PlayStation 1, it really shows how far the game has come since. In that one, the colored lighting and new audio felt more tacked on than part of the experience, while here, the game was built around both. But where the improvements shine the most is in the combat. 
The game has an excellent mix of roaming monsters and ones that spawn in at certain moments, like a mix of classic and new doom. While some areas can be a little claustrophobic, this is not to the game's detriment, it's just different. I don't think I've ever had more fun shooting demons than I did here. Almost every single enemy and weapon has a moment to shine. And these weapons have been improved as well. The chainsaw is much more powerful this time around, making it still viable next to Berserk. Many of the guns also fire faster and have more kickback. There's also a new weapon, the Unmade Demon Laser, which everyone and their grandma has already talked about, so I won't get into it. Basically, it starts out weak, but you make it stronger by collecting demon keys. It reduces challenge, but getting to that point is the challenge. Not all is perfect, of course. The shotguns lack animations, and the chain gun's kickback when firing is a neat effect, but, but it's raining on the ice when tapping the button. The sprites of the fists are also laughably small, and even put me off of using Berserk, because I was never sure when I was hitting anything. Enemies have been reworked as well, with lost souls and pain elementals dying much quicker, which is good, and the latter even spawning two of the format once. Similarly, Erectotrons fire two plasma balls now, making them even more of a hassle to deal with than before. Zombies do look identical despite carrying different weapons, but considering how quickly they drop, this hardly matters. The only issue I have is the final boss, which was entirely too easy and over too quickly. You can see in this footage that I was genuinely surprised when I killed it 10 seconds after it spawned. The demons you have to fight before it didn't make it any better either. It's as if they combined the Spider Mastermind's fight, which was over in seconds, with the enemy span of the Icon of Sin, resulting in a boss battle that's not just disappointing, but deflating. Lastly, there's also a few strobe light effects in the game, not enough to give you seizures, but enough to be a little bit distracting. And yet, none of these issues detract from the overall game's quality. Doom 64 feels like a marriage of the old and the new, not diving into entirely new territories like Wake did, but putting enough of a spin on existing mechanics to feel fresh. I'd argue that it's able to stand toe to toe with games like Duke Nukem 3D and Blood, which can't be said about Doom 1 and 2. Alright, am I on your good side yet? Great. Then let's head into... The Bad. Starting with my first and weakest gripe. The game may have been released on the N64, but it wasn't made for it. Have you ever seen the N64's controller? Yes, I have the Pikachu variant, very cute. Anyway, this thing was not made for controlling FPS games. Heck, it was barely made for controlling anything. You can play the game either via the D-pad or via the control stick, neither options being good. The form allows you to strafe easier using the shoulder buttons, but turning is much harder. The stick lets you move easier, but to strafe, you're pretty much locked to holding a single button to strafe left and right. You can rebind the controls, but there's not a very comfortable setup for either of them. This wouldn't be that big of a deal, usually. Heck, I played Wolfenstein on the Atari Jaguar, which has this controller. And that's my favorite version of the game. The problem with Doom 64, however, is that the game requires some incredibly fast movement on the player's part. In the very second level, a keycard spawns on a platform. A platform that you need to lower with the switch a good couple meters away, and then sprint towards it before it raises back up. This is downright impossible to do on the actual console, and that was exactly where my attempt to replay the game a month ago ended. The second level! And that's unfortunately not the only instance, some of which I'll talk about later. The game also likes to do these time challenges for obtaining optional items. The level Blood Keep requires you to press a button, run up some stairs, drop down, lower bookshelf, ride the bookshelf back up, and then jump through the door that just opened before it closes. I could barely do this with a keyboard and mouse, I have no idea how they expected players to do this back in 1997 with this thing. But the N64 version has another quirk. You can't save while playing a level, only afterwards. If you die, you have to restart the entire stage over. This isn't uncommon for games of the era, and I did beat Doom 2 on the GBA several times with this limitation. And that's the same Doom 2 which has several moments where the player is likely to die right before the exit. Tricks and traps as lowering platforms come to mind, which also forced me to skip to the next level using a password in the PS1 version. It's annoying for sure, but merely an oversight when porting the game with quick saving to a console where that's not possible. However, Doom 64 also has these beginner's traps. A lot of them. It really likes to spam enemies and projectiles at you just as you're about to leave an area, especially when you're navigating itty bitty platforms over death pits you can't escape from. Oh, and my absolute favorite, killing the player because they happen to not know exactly where to stand the first time they encounter the room. 
I played the game on the N64 when I was younger and that room was exactly where my run ended. I gave it several more attempts, the map now being burned into my mind even 10 years later, but because I happened to be standing in the wrong place at the wrong time, I was slowly being lowered into my own grave with no way out. And you know what that means, pistol starting the entire level of course. I'm willing to overlook these issues for ports of Doom to consoles. They're annoying but understandable. But Doom 64 was made for the Nintendo 64, it's in the damn title. Then why is it the builder of the system's limitations? Why punish the player so severely? It's inexcusable in every sense of the word. Luckily for Doom 64, the game received ports to the PC which thankfully get rid of these issues. Much like Duke Nukem 64, it's a blast to play with an actual keyboard and mouse and I'm so happy that I was finally able to beat the game without getting frustrated. Is what I would be saying, were there not even more issues? And these ones unfortunately can't be fixed by a PC port. No, they are baked into the core DNA of the game itself. The biggest problem that Doom 64 faces is cryptic progression. Levels may be smaller in scale, but are far more complex, requiring a lot of backtracking or going through random teleporters. It's almost as if every map is like the Unholy Cathedral or the Citadel from the previous two games. Granted, this isn't necessarily a downside as exploration is part of Doom, and just because a level isn't straightforward, that doesn't mean it's poorly designed. It just means there's a lot of downtime when trying to figure out where to go. But that's the key word, actually finding the way forward. That part isn't always very obvious for various reasons, as a lot of progression is locked behind hitting a random switch on a wall without any indication of what it does. It's hard to find specific examples of this, as pretty much all maps do it at one point or another. In pitfalls, you need to activate a switch and then run backwards through the entire level to get to a set of bars that have now opened up, but which you might have already forgotten about. I once made a video about why I prefer keys in Doom maps over switches, because keys actually let you know what you need from the start. You see a locked blue door, so you can keep in mind that you need a blue key, and once you have that, you know you can unlock any and all blue doors. But if you come across some bars, who knows how they'll open? Maybe it's a switch. Maybe you need to kill all enemies. Maybe it's an invisible line on the floor. The player has no way of knowing. The game actually combines these two at one point, uh, very awkwardly. In Unholy Temple, you need to press switches in a specific order to open certain doors, which is the first and only time the game does this. The issue is that this is never conveyed to the player and only hinted at by the order of colored bars next to the doors you want to open. I was confused as to why the switches I just pressed kept unlocking themselves when I re-entered the room and why sometimes it spawned monsters instead. Once I had realized what I needed to do, I had to then run back and forth between the doors and the switches to input the right combination. The issue is that there's no jingle for getting the order right, so at first I already thought I was doing something wrong. I was about to try and error my way through the puzzle, but getting the order wrong locks you into a room with the Hell Knights. Like, sir, this is Doom, not Texan. Doom was never about cryptic puzzles like that, and honestly shouldn't be. I'm here to shoot monsters, not wander aimlessly. And wander aimlessly you will, because sometimes the way forward is hidden behind something that doesn't even strike as interactive. In Spawn Fear, you need to lower a random, unmarked bookshelf to progress. I legitimately thought I was doing an elaborate secret until I went back to the original room, only to discover there was nothing else there. This is on the same level as needing to drop down a random hole in the wall in the spirit world. At a different point of the same level, you need to shoot a switch on the wall that looks identical to the ones next to them, but which are only decorative. I hated how often the previous Doom games would use switches as decoration, so it's disappointing to see them make the same mistake here. But the worst example of them all appears relatively early on in Final Outpost. Let me paint the picture. Ahead of you is a key and a pedestal that you cannot reach. There are two switches. One lowers the pedestal, but also lowers the cage around the key. The other raises the cage, but alongside with the key. A classic conundrum. How do you solve this one? Here, I'll give you a few seconds. The answer? You don't! You leave the room and press use on a random, completely unrelated wall texture. The game lies to you! It lies! It's hiding the pieces and expecting you to put them together anyway. How is this fair? How is the player meant to figure this one out? Even when I got the solution, I didn't feel I'd overcome a challenge or become smarter. I felt cheated. 
I don't care if the wall texture is the same as the one on the pedestal, it's not enough. When you show me a puzzle like that, I don't expect to have to walk away from it. The game was telling me to find Waldo, but he was actually standing behind me all along. And that's not even getting into how to obtain one of the demon keys. Since I didn't do this one myself, I'll let a clip of Vacant Skull's video speak for itself, and then you'll see why I didn't bother with it. To start, you have to go to this platform here, which reveals this section with a Hell Knight. Kill it and head over to the platform to push this button. This lowers another platform back where you started for a couple of seconds. Get on it and you'll see another button which you have to shoot. Doing so drops another platform near the first, which spawns in another Hell Knight by the first button again. Kill this one again and then rinse and repeat to lower the last platform. How are you supposed to figure this out on your own, I'll never know. I used a guide after about 20 minutes of frustration. I need to emphasize, they wanted you to do this on the N64. Granted, it's a secret level for an optional item, but holy hell. There were often points in the game where I was accidentally uncovering secret areas before I'd even figured out where to go, since the process is about as cryptic for both of them. And that kind of sucked when it gave me a power up that by the time I'd actually found the way forward had already run out. People to this day keep making fun of Downtown from Doom 2 having a big arrow pointing the way, but at least it shows you where to go. And even if you don't see it right away, you're gonna end up in the right place eventually, as nothing is required of the player but walking forward. Meanwhile, Doom 64 expects the player to keep track of every location they've come across, just because it might be where they need to go next. Well, if the game isn't outright lying to them, of course. And this is kind of where the game's more elaborately detailed level design works against itself. Doom 1 and 2's maps may not look the greatest visually, but if something is out of place, it's most likely significant. A misaligned wall texture, a sector with different lighting, it all stands out. But in Doom 64, it just blends together. The cohesive design is not working in tandem with the game progression. They were too busy creating levels that look far more advanced than anything that had come before that they failed to keep it readable. Ultimately, the game is still pretty damn good, especially because of the new visuals. And when it comes to the combat, it surpasses all previous Doom games. There's no cheap difficulty like spamming enemies or sniping you from off screen, and it's even kind enough to shower you in health and ammo constantly. Despite not adding any noteworthy monsters, Doom 64 manages to remix existing ones and create interesting combinations with them. It makes the game feel fresh despite not actually doing anything new. But if I ever see a Hell Knight ever again, I am going to scream. However, I can in good conscience say that it's 100% better than Doom 1 or 2. It doesn't fall into the same traps, but creates new ones, sometimes literally. It's very ambitious, but sometimes that turns into overambition and obscures what should have been a clear way forward. It's still a ton of fun to play, arguably more than the previous titles, but that's with the big disclaimer of needing to know what you have to do. It's unforgiving for newcomers and almost expect to have beaten a Doom before. If you're aware of where to go, then it's not an issue, but that's not an argument in favor of it. Still, I'm more willing to replay it over Episode 4 and especially Plutonia and TNT. However, the 2020 re-release also added a couple of quote lost levels, which were made from the ground up just for the port. And these are a massive improvement. There is zero cryptic regression with maps flowing naturally from one room to another. There are no beginner ramps, and even when enemies spawn in, it's not unforgiving or cruel. It's just good, straightforward, old-school Doom fun. Ironically, I think that's why these levels don't stand out much to me. But it shows that Doom 64's formula can and does work, if you don't overdo it. I'd rather play something that leaves me hungry for more than something which I'm sick of because it keeps lingering on. And in that sense, it's time to end the video. I'd like to hear what you think though, especially if you were on Team Doom 64 in the first place. Please also let me know if you'd like me to make more videos like this one. It's been ages since I've done a review and it's still a lot of fun. Just write it down below. And if you want to support me further, then you can do that by dropping a like, subscribing to my channel and even by donating directly to my Patreon to see new videos one week earlier than everyone else. Anything is appreciated. But for now, thank you very much for watching, have a wonderful day, and goodbye.